Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. We have Jacob Wall on the show today. Jacob, can you please introduce yourself to the audience? Well, it's great to be here, Yossi. It's great to join you on the show today. Uh, it's as good a time as ever to discuss so many issues uh, in the world here as we start off 2023. So uh, thanks for having me. So, so um, it's my pleasure to have you on. This past Sunday, Brazil had their own January 6th. I want to hear your opinion on it. Well, there's not a lot known about where that protest began or who's behind it or anything like that. Um, it seems to be something which is unlikely to change the regime in Brazil. But what's perhaps most important of all is the fate of all of these countries south of the U.S. border, where we've seen one by one, they've been taken over by left-wing socialists, and in some cases, communists, uh, Mexico, of course, Peru, Colombia, Ecuador, now Brazil, one country after the next taken over by what are essentially communists. And this is going to be a major problem for the United States because these countries are already so poor. They already have a sense of rule of law that is hardly existent at all. They're already rife with corruption. And what we see is that once they're taken over by communists, it gets worse and worse. And so we could see a situation where instead of having a million or two million people come across our border on a busy month uh, claiming asylum, we could have 10 million. And so that's really the concern. That's that's what I watch in the macro here. I, I think it's unlikely that in the micro, this is likely to change anything. I understand the Brazilians are trying to bring back the former president, Bolsonaro, and prosecute him. The current regime is. We'll see what happens there. Hopefully, Biden doesn't throw him to the wolves. I understand he's living in Orlando now. So it's hard to know exactly what the prospects for this protest are and what's likely to come out of that. I anticipate not much. I anticipate the grip on power of the, the communists there is reasonably strong. And that if there's going to be a an overturning of power, it's going to have to be a really forceful military coup that takes place in the dead of night, which I would support and which I think the U.S. government should support, but they don't seem likely to do that. Well, Biden is leading a very tyrannical regime himself, so I think he's supportive of what's going, what the Brazilian government is doing. Um, right. Biden is a disgrace to the human president to American presidency, in my opinion. I've made myself clear multiple times throughout social media. Um, but I could see Biden throwing uh, Bolsonaro back into Brazil. It's something that I hope we could, I hope they don't do. I hope that Biden is someone that just stays out of it, even though I don't see that happening. I so, hope so as well. I hope he stays out of it or or that Bolsonaro can make his way maybe to a third country, perhaps uh, Switzerland or someplace like that that is known for being neutral in these kinds of affairs. Yeah, the Swiss is known to be very neutral. They People go to Swiss all the, Swiss all the time to get away from these tech things. Mm -hmm. But the real reason why there's so much tyrannical regimes is because they they all are um they're controlling a lot more the uh the the globalists they're all uh working together that's my what I'm trying to say they're all working together to control and we have to break apart the globalists I don't know if I'm saying something wrong but I think globalists when they work together they're stronger and that's what right right well it is it is a concentration of wealth and power and influence the likes of which we've never seen in the world where you have just in the united states alone the left controlling the presidency they control the senate they essentially may as well control the house republicans on paper have a very thin majority there but they may as well be in control of the house and of course 
all across the country, they control many powerful elements of the federal bench, not quite the Supreme Court yet, but many elements of the federal bench. And of course, many elements of state and local courts across the country. And the left controls Hollywood, and they control the universities, and they control big tech. They control Facebook, and they control Instagram. And by all appearances, they still control some vestiges of Twitter, and they control Google, of course, which owns YouTube, and they control that very strongly. Apple, of course, which owns uh, a, a great market share of of all information flow vis-a-vis -vis their app store around the world. So it is a daunting, daunting challenge that we face when so many of the elements of power, I didn't even name that this, the scientific establishment, that public health establishment, all controlled by the left, corporate America in most forms controlled by the left. It is a, a, a daunting challenge that I, I don't exactly see what the answer to is, but we don't have any choice but to fight back against it. If there were a choice, that would be one thing, but we're not even left with a choice. And so uh, that that's where we that's where we are now. And you're absolutely right that these various kind of elements of power work together. And in in some ways, it's much more challenging than facing off against, say, one single brutal dictator in a tyrannical regime of, of the past, let's say, or even in one that might exist around the world today, you could cut off the head of the snake and then you could relieve yourself of, of, of the boot on the neck of uh, freedom and, and liberty and all things that we hold dear. But in, in today's society, what we face is, is something more like a, like a hydra. It's like an octopus. It has tentacles of power that reach all through society and you could cut off one, but while it regrows, you've got 10 more that will converge around you. And so it's a, it's a very, very stark situation that we face. Very, very true. You just have to fight back. You said that Twitter is still controlled by the left at some point. I don't know if the audience knows you're still banned. Do you think that there's any chance that Elon Musk can entirely save Twitter? Well, I, I don't, I, I'm hopeful that I'm brought back to Twitter. I was banned from Twitter, it's hard to believe, almost four years ago in late February of 2019. And I'm hopeful that, that I will be brought back. I assume it, it could happen any moment uh, as we as we speak here on, on, on Wednesday, uh, January the uh, 11th. But we shall see. Uh, it seems that accounts are being brought back. It's it, It's happening very slowly, very arbitrarily. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of rhyme or reason to it. So True. I don't know. I'm I'm hopeful. One of the other concerns, of course, is the capital structure situation at Twitter. Uh, Elon Musk, of course, very, very bravely bought that company, essentially at the very peak of the tech market. He was selling Tesla shares all leading up to that. He knew it was the peak of the tech market. $44 billion today. If you look at the corporate debt market. There's still some Twitter uh, bonds and notes that trade on the open market. And, and based on the trading price of that debt, you can imply a valuation to Twitter. And if you look at the implied valuation today, it's somewhere between 10 and $12 billion. So he's taken an absolute bath on the valuation of Twitter. Obviously, Tesla shareholders have not been too happy about him spending time on anything besides Tesla. They've uh, responded by selling off a lot of Tesla shares. And that's been a theme across the tech uh, ecosystem. All of those shares have been sold off. Just about every tech company's big uh, down uh, into, into the beginning of this year. So he's very selflessly taken this on. He's seen a great deal of his net worth wiped out. He's been attacked by the left. He didn't have to do this. Now, hopefully what he can do is, is return Twitter to being the public square. And I'm I'm quite confident that if he does that, the enterprise value issues will take care of themselves. I mean, you well, can do things so. like I read a report today. I read a report today. You can, they're, they're thinking about auctioning off certain usernames that were taken up, but were dormant and auctioning them off. Perhaps that's something you can do. Uh, but I think that the enterprise value will take care of itself. If Twitter is once again, the public square, I don't think it is yet the public square. Uh, I remember, you know, before I was banned on Twitter and so many others were banned, 
you'd walk around and just just walking around Washington, D.C., people were talking about Twitter or walking around anywhere. They were talking about tweets they saw. They were talking about, did you see this on Twitter? Did you see that on Twitter? People were, it was part of the uh, ethos on the streets and, and, and in other places around the country too. As the banning took place, that was no longer the case. And even today, accounts are just slowly being brought back. It's nothing quite like before. And, and still, I don't really hear about Twitter being a big topic of discussion day to day. I, I think the volume is still way down from the highs. They claim it's at all-time highs. I don't know. I think if you look at least on political Twitter, the, the volume's way down over the past several years. Just the overall number of real active users. Well, Elon is keep on talking about this uh, this information and hate speech. He's saying hate speech is down. So I don't know how pro free speech he is. But that's a, that's a whole nother topic. I've been very critical, skeptical, not critical, skeptical about that. Um, but well, let's talk just briefly about that. I think it's one standard that you know is 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 worthy of just discussing. There's a. A platform that I'm sure most many people have heard about called Gap. Site runs pretty well. Uh, it looks very nice, I think. Um, obviously, they've come under massive leftist attack. Their standard is that if it doesn't violate the law, then it's held under free speech. Um, okay, that's one standard, but they don't consider certain elements of the law, it would seem like. They don't consider a, a long held principle in the law known as fighting words, uh, which are, which are, laid out by the Supreme Court and other courts is to be words likely to cause violence. So you walk into a bar and you say to a, to a walk into a biker bar and, and you yell at a biker guy, I F you, I F your mother or something like this. Well, you can be charged with disorderly conduct for saying that. Those words are considered fighting words. In other words, words likely to cause, uh, to cause a, a violent reaction by a reasonable person, because lots of people can be made to do violent things by words that are perfectly benign, but by a reasonable person. Gab doesn't seem to recognize that standard. And that's why Gab has, has become a cesspool, really, of, of uh, just, you know, con content, which is, which is so vitriolic and lacks so much in utility that I don't think Gab is a place that very many people stop in to just browse content. I mean, I simul post there just like I do on Truth Social, for the most part, the same things I post on my Telegram channel. But you you can't really browse through there because it, it, based on the fact that they don't recognize that section of the law, it, it causes a problem. Now, when you go into this broad term of hate speech, that's not anything that anybody recognizes. That's never been codified in any U.S. court, certainly, but in any true setting. And so hate speech is a purposefully vague term that's used by the left so that they can say that any speech they don't like, or even any topic that they would rather not have discussed, that, that any mention of that topic, that any even uh, allusion to that topic is hate speech, and thus must be banned, and the person who said it must be removed from the public square permanently. And so that's that's a problem, obviously. we don't I don't recognize hate speech as being a a term of art that should that that has any legitimacy. So I actually did a piece of Gab, the convenient truth of Gab. I wrote it for my website, um, and in it I said that part of the problem with Gab is that Mr. Torba has to separate learn how to separate his religion from policy. A lot of people hate. I hate dislike when he's cursing out Jews or whatever from his religious standpoint. So that's what I wrote about. And I hear what you're saying about fighting words because that would that would uh, if they would recognize that, I think a lot more people would go to the gap. I think you're right. Yeah, the, the other problem that these competing sites have is that they're just simply too late to the game, too. That's the other problem. I mean, pe people forget that when Facebook came out, they as soon as they would allow the site to be used by different groups and you know open the site up to, the, say, the general public, they were attracting 50 million users within 48 hours. 
Okay. And, 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 and MySpace was doing similar growth rates and Friendster was doing similar growth rates. And then, you know, the, the reason that these sites were able to grow principally on the web, principally on a desktop at the time is because people used to engage in an activity and you used to hear them talk about this called surfing the web. And maybe occasionally people still say that, but in a broad sense, what it meant is that people were looking for new things to do on the internet. They, they, oh, here's a new site. There were a large group of people where they had a television set and they, they knew what the guide on the television set, where it stopped and started and what channels existed on TV. And, and then they had the computer and it was a wide open world. And there was a large group of people, billions of people, in fact, at least 2 billion people who were looking for new stuff, actively searching it out. And so when you raise your hand and you had Facebook and you had a site and, oh, there's my friend, you had easy viral effects. And then some later platforms like Snapchat and Instagram uh, did this on the phone. And so Instagram was a site that I think was sold within 18 months for over a billion dollars to Facebook. And at the time, what you had was something called app discovery. The The concept of an app on your phone was still a uh, something that was considered novel and interesting and, and kind of would be talked about. You know, people would come up with like an app on the phone that was just a dumb thing. It was like a, a lighter app that you hold up your lighter at a concert, but it's a lighter on your phone and it's a Zippo lighter. It's a big lighter. You could pick the lighter and they'd sell millions of dollars in revenue. That uh, discovery effect, the large captive audience of people looking for a new app actively that they've never tried or, or actively looking for a new website on the web, it doesn't exist any longer. The internet's more mature. And so if you come into this environment and you say, we've got a new platform, it is an extraordinarily difficult uphill battle in which people find themselves essentially trying to buy eyeballs, desperately trying to get people onto the apps, desperately trying to you know pay celebrities to use the apps and, and pay them to promote the apps. And invariably it fails. It always does. There's no true organic viral effect to any of these things. And then it doesn't help matters when they put out the app, like Truth Social or like Parler, and it's a half-assed platform. You know, either it's it doesn't work reliably, it seizes up, it's got 2004 web design to it, it lacks basic features. I mean, the, the Truth Social is hardly. I think they finally improved the font and the color when it first came out. I could hardly read the text on the app because, at least if you weren't trying to, I meant you really had to focus because it was like a, it was like a light gray text against the white background. You just you couldn't see it. All of that. So it doesn't help matters if you half-ass the technology. The reality is, if you want to build these kind of apps, you have to do it in Silicon Valley. You 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 can't start it in Florida. You cannot start it in Brooklyn uh, or. Chicago or any other place for those kinds of technology businesses, they have to be done in Northern California. And there's a number of reasons for that. The big law firms that do the structuring of the companies, they're all based there. Their division that does that are based there. You, you, you can't even structure the company if you don't do it there in, in order to raise the money. The venture capitalists are based there. And most importantly of all, the talent is based there, the development talent. Are there some guys in Florida or Austin or New York who could Theoretically program the app, yes. But the people who you really want to do it, they're in Northern California still. That could change over 10 years. It seems to be trending in another direction. But so so it it's not something where these platforms, these alternative platforms have much of a chance. The last one that broke out was Telegram, but it hasn't achieved any level of virality in the US. In Eastern Europe, it's ubiquitous. It's more popular than Twitter. It's more, it's more popular than Facebook, but it, it's not used here in America. So- I mean, besides a few, you know, holdouts like us who who don't have any choice. Oh, yeah, because you had I don't know how many thousands of followers on Twitter. A couple hundred, couple hundred thousand, basically, and I had Trump retweeting me and all of that. I mean, huge. I I had a couple hundred thousand followers, but there were many more people who would check my Twitter account religiously, but didn't want to show as following me. And so it was really, I was getting something at the time like four or 500 million impressions a month. Nobody is getting those kind of numbers on Twitter today, but besides maybe Elon Musk, I think he is, but in the political space, 
there's nobody getting those kind of numbers every month today. Even if they have 2 million followers, they're not getting those kinds of impressions. It, it's just the volume has died off. They, they killed their own company to a large degree. And that was one thing that I was hopeful for. You know, I, I kind of hoped that, for instance, with Facebook, who banned me, I don't know, uh, September, late September, early October, I think it was late September of 2020, out of nowhere. I had 150,000 plus followers on Instagram. And I thought, well, they banned me. And you figure, well, maybe they're so you know, greedy that, you know, they're not going to ban everybody to where they're just going to kill their own business, are they? Because, you know, they depend on active eyeballs and people are going to go to TikTok, people are going to go to other places. And, but I was wrong. They were actually willing to destroy their own business in the name of political censorship. And look at Facebook now. The company's down. It's, it's, it's all but basically it trades like a penny stock today. I mean, it trades at a it trades at a ten x multiple. It trades like it's uh, U.S. Steel or something, not a cutting edge technology company. And that's because they were willing to actually destroy the company in the name of censorship, which which shocked even me. Well, sometimes I don't know what they were getting in exchange for censoring at the will of the left or whatever political censorship. Sometimes people do. Add things ah, at the risk of maybe for the own back pocket or whatever it is. It's yeah, a disgrace. I, it's a disgrace. Yeah, it, it certainly is a disgrace. They had, they had everything going for them and then they just wiped it all out. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 sickening, really. And um, because of the structure of that company, they were not really able to fire Mark Zuckerberg, which I'm sure many shareholders really wanted to do along the way as they saw the value of their holdings in this company, which had been one of the all-time great performing stocks, despite all the challenges. It'd been one of the all-time high performance stocks ever in history. And a dynamite business. I mean printing printing money. Absolutely printing money. But if you take out the growth, what is it? If you take out the growth, it is essentially Facebook is Okay, they got their Instagram holding over here, which advertises to young people. It's being walked all over by TikTok. And then you have Facebook, which is a legacy ad tech platform now, basically to advertise things to old people. It, Facebook is almost an anachronism now. It really is. And so it is, it's it's disturbing what they were willing to do in destroying their company. And 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 by the way, as I mentioned to TikTok, I should point out. There are plenty of reasons to ban TikTok. It's an addictive product. They woefully violate what they claim to do. They invite children on the platform. It's a platform that's infested with sexual predators, pedophiles of all stripes, as we've shown in our Predator DC television series, which I encourage people to watch. Predator DC. I'll link to, show. I'll link to your channels. That would be great. They can they can check that out. And if any episode they don't see on YouTube because it's missing because somebody flagged it, it's on Rumble if it's not on YouTube. And we're coming out with more. I'm still backed up. I've still got, oh, 60 predators that we've still got to edit the footage and put out there. I mean, we're still backed up with footage. We've probably got two years of footage. So every all of every one of them will get their day in terms of exposure. But it's there's so there's a whole lot whole lot of reasons to, to ban TikTok. There's a whole lot of reasons to ban TikTok, but you know, when you hear senators calling to ban TikTok, they use these vague a accusations of like data privacy and data analytics and CCP, this, that, or the other. That's because those senators are saying that at the behest of Facebook. Facebook hires lobbyists in DC. I'm a lobbyist by day, but I don't lobby for Facebook. And, and I know lobbyists who do. These lobbyists are having these senators read these talking points. And they're basically saying ban TikTok in the US so that people have to use Instagram's product. They couldn't care less about the degenerate content that exists on TikTok, which, by the way, exists to some percentage on Instagram, but not nearly the same percentage. Um, and so TikTok corrupting children is not part of the motive of these lawmakers like Marco Rubio who want to ban it. They're just doing it because Facebook's lobbyists asked them to. Just so everyone knows on that issue, it's 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 important to recognize. I think TikTok should be banned, but not for the reasons that Mark Zuckerberg thinks it should be banned. I hear you. Thanks for the clarification. 
Yeah. People think it. People think that the politicians are genuine when they say it's because of China. Mm-hmm. People need to learn that politicians are never genuine. Right. Never. Nearly. And uh, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Jacob, for coming on the show. You bet. It's been great to great to be with you and cover and, some um, Only good things. Everyone, I'll see you next week. And uh, remember, hold everyone accountable.